Now for a conversation on the legacy of the Fair Housing Act, please welcome Howard Husick, Vice President of Research and Publications at the Manhattan Institute, Vanita Gupta, President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and Dave Stevens, President and CEO of the Mortgage Bankers Association. Here to lead the conversation, please welcome Atlantic Senior Editor Jillian White. Good morning, good morning. So I want to start with a little bit of a framing question that I want to put to all of you. And that is, to what extent have the goals of the Fair Housing Act been achieved in the past 50 years? Dave, I want to start with you. You know, I think it's a mixed story. I think on the one hand that, um, you know, there's clear laws in place that eliminate or at least make it legally um, culpable to discriminate based on race, sex, et cetera, uh, sexual preference. Um, but we still live in a world today where the opportunity for home ownership and for safe housing has great disparities in it. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, it, it's an area that needs a lot of work and I actually think right now the timing is really important for this conversation because in many ways, we're in a housing crisis when you look at the cost of housing and who's getting access to it. There's massive disparities between the white, non-Hispanic population and minority communities. So that's something that needs a lot of focus. Anina? I think the promise of the Fair Housing Act remains to be fully realized. Um, obviously, when it was enacted a week after Martin Luther King's assassination, came after many years of advocacy to try to get it enacted, and it holds a lot of really important principles. Housing is the basic block of our communities and the right to a safe and, and um, accessible housing is a really core part of how we live. But I think the reality is that um, there have been a long series of you know, decades of federally engineered segregation. And we remain deeply segregated in housing, which has impacts on education, transportation, access to employment. Uh, and so, and you know, studies show that black home ownership rates today are at the levels they were 50 years ago because despite a lot of progress that had been made, the 2008 financial crisis really wiped a lot of that out and the recovery has not been equally felt by all communities. And so, uh, you know, again, we have always throughout our history made enormous progress and the enactment of laws has been a marker and milestone of that progress. But the fact remains that when uh, laws don't get fully implemented, and I think actually the Fair Housing Act is one of the laws that has probably been the most subject to political whim of our landmark civil rights legislation. So you've seen leaps forward and leaps back, administration to administration. It's really halted the ability for the act to be fully implemented with the rigor that was intended um, uh, by the folks who had been really pushing for it. So there's a lot of work to do uh, to really address profound segregation uh, and we have to remember that there is nothing, there's no naturally occurring phenomena about why segregation exists. It's manufactured by human beings and therefore to be undone requires an explicit and intentional set of policies and practices uh, to be able to address that kind of longstanding um, segregation. Yeah. Well, I think one would have to be incredibly naive not to think and understand that it's more difficult and more complicated to rent or buy a home if one is an African American. I think that was true when the Voting Rights Act was passed, and I think it has continued to be true. However, uh, there has been some important changes. Uh, colleagues of mine, Ed Glazer, who was an economist at Harvard, and Jacob Vigdor, who was an economist at the University of Washington, uh, looked at the census data. And today, segregated neighborhoods, as defined by racial concentration, are far less common than they were at the time of the uh, passage of the uh, Fair Housing Act. 50 years ago, 20% of census tracts in the United States had zero black residents. Today, for every 200 neighborhoods in the United States, 199 are not all white. That is, there are black residents in virtually every census tract. That may not mean a lot. It may not mean that they're not having a hard time getting a house there, but all white neighborhoods in the United States are effectively extinct. Even in Chicago, if you look at what's called, economists call the dissimilarity index, how different is one neighborhood from another neighborhood? Is it all one race or is it all one other race? Overall dissimilarity in Chicago, known as one of the most segregated cities in the United States, 
has declined between 1970 and 2010 by 25 percentage points. Agree, work to be done, but, and the government may not have done a good job implementing the law, but mortgage bankers all post that sign up, Fair Housing Act, and it makes a difference. Can, can I just, I yeah. mean, one, one point to, and, and there's a lot of data, and you can say that's gentrification causing the, uh, and, and affordable housing that's creating some of this uh, change in certain communities, particularly in urban communities. But, but you know, one of the things I look at, which I think is a, a, a real testament to the challenge that we face, is the median FICO score for African Americans in this country, and this is just fact, is 624. The median FICO score for all Americans is about 719. Uh, if you look at lending policies, even under qualified mortgage rules, most lenders, even FHA, most lenders won't lend in those programs below around 620 without adding, with FICO scores below 620. So you got the median FICO score for African Americans is 624, and once you drop below 620, which is about half of that population, you end up finding it harder to access credit. What's most interesting about that is a large percentage of that uh, population that's below 620 uh, has thin file credit, meaning less than two reported credit histories. Uh, if you're an Uber driver, Uber doesn't report your loan for your car. Uh, your t utilities often aren't reported. Your rent payments aren't reported. Your, your car loan that you got from a, a used car dealer or a subprime auto uh, dealer, those typically are not reported to your credit histories. And so you end up with uh, a, a reality that the lack of credit also creates bad credit. And so the question is, you know, we can talk about the problems, but we need to be talking about the opportunities and what we solve for. And I think, unfortunately, some of the square peg, square hole underwriting mentality that we've created, on the one hand, eliminates the ability for too much subjectivity, which can protect against redlining and those kinds of things. At the other end, how do we solve for it if the, if the system being used, and I'll use the credit scoring one as mm -hmm. a prime example, ultimately causes these incredible mm -hmm. disparities. So that's, that's something I think all of us need to think about focusing on. Well, I want to ask the question then, whose responsibility is it to help fix that? Um, as you said, we have a thin credit file problem that tends to afflict people of color more so. That means that they cannot get houses, they can't get convention conventional loans. That is how families build their wealth. So it creates this cycle where it becomes impossible or near impossible to build the kind of wealth to have a home, someplace where it's going to appreciate in value. So whose responsibility is it and how can we fix that? Well, uh, you're looking at me, so I'll answer quickly. I know everybody has thoughts here. Um, you know, there's tipping points on all sides. Uh, when I came into the Obama administration in 2009 as federal housing commissioner, uh, there was a program called, um, uh, which was seller-funded down payment assistance. That was an effort to actually try to help people without down payments buy a home, and it became a seller-funded program. That had default rates, cumulative default rates of about 35%, mm -hmm. and, and that was heavily concentrated in minority communities, which I think were preyed upon, quite frankly, by people who saw that as an opportunity to use that program, and I won't go as, into all the reasons as to why it failed, but the outcome was real. So we've gotta be careful about those tipping points. I do think one of the great opportunities right now is to be looking at the buyer of today who have multiple sources of income in their household, some of which are not reported in traditional ways that may have multiple family members with, with living with them that support their income stream. We've talked about those who drive for Uber and other kinds of uh, self-employed vehicles or rent out part of their homes um, through some of the services online to, to generate income. Uh, but all of this leads me to start off with is something at its base level. Why are we still relying on a traditional credit scoring methodology that underscores uh, uh, demographics that may just simply not have the traditional way of establishing a credit score when that is one of the primary drivers to getting a prime uh, 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 rate on a mortgage. And by the way, I'm way overlooking affordable housing stock and wage separation and all of these things that uh, pile on the economics of being able to get access to, to housing, but uh, what we really need is we need a universal focus to say we're in a housing crisis. And believe me, when you look at the poverty levels of those who can't even afford uh, minimum rents today, uh, it's dramatic. Anyway, so I'll, 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 I'll shut up. But I think, you know, in the end of the day, we've got a lot of work to do. Someone's got to declare this as a national priority. So I, I think that's, um, I agree with a lot of the stuff on credit. And, we, and I think sometimes with the Fair Housing Act, people forget that there was like huge parts of this act that were about access to credit, which frankly goes to almost every aspect of life that, that we live. But I mean, the, the responsibility is, 
a shared one. And I, I agree that there hasn't, we don't feel like we're in a crisis on housing, but in, a, in communities of color and certain other communities, we are, it is a profound crisis and remains one. Uh, and you know, I headed up the Civil Rights Division for the last almost two and a half years of the Obama administration where we enforced the Fair Housing Act and there were efforts by HUD at that point to put out um, rules that were setting intentional, giving teeth to the Fair Housing Act through the affirmatively furthering fair housing um, uh, 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 order. So there's, there were a number of things that were happening in, around government. The federal government has a huge role to play because they also had a huge role to play in fueling segregation and segregated housing um, in unequal access to credit and the like. And so, and you can't undermine that. And the, the role of the federal government to give meaning to uh, to the Fair Housing Act remains still alive despite the rollbacks that we're currently seeing both across enforcement at the two agencies that, that enforce. But there's also a great responsibility among banks. Um, and I think that there's, you know, you know, for lending institutions to get engaged in this effort. And we've seen a lot of banks really take this under, um, take initiative and leadership to, to address these issues. There's been more of a move to address how criminal convictions, criminal records are also mm -hmm. creating the vast racial disparities um, that we're seeing in barring people from accessing everything from public housing to private housing and to, to credit. Um, and I think there's been a lot of leadership among some key banks recently to kind of deal with that in the absence of a federal government that has made this a priority. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of shared responsibility here, but I think um, it's absolutely true that given the importance of housing in our lives and in our communities, there needs to be a much, much greater focus on what's happening right now. On the, the credit score uh, issue, uh, I, I want to link that back to, to the point about the high foreclosures and the financial crisis and how that's disadvantaged uh, uh, wealth creation in the minority community. I couldn't agree more with that. And I think we have to be very careful to the point uh, about that high foreclosure rate on the experimental uh, HUD program. We do not do anybody a favor if we relax credit requirements too much. Right? Asset growth, wealth creation happens when whole neighborhoods remain good. The worst thing, I remember in the early days of the housing crisis, visiting the back of the yards, which is also in Chicago, and going door to door talking to people for a magazine article about what did it mean to have a foreclosed house next to you. Decimating. Working class people who have the house next door be vacant, that is a nightmare for them. We have to protect them by making sure that good credit is extended to people who are credit worthy. That has always been a protection for neighbors. Do we have to be expansive about understanding who is a good credit risk? Yes. But when we have uh, uh, affordable housing goals, sometimes we may stretch those too far. And we have to be careful, not because we're worried about banks, but because we're worried about minority homeowners. And in that context of wealth creation, we do have to keep in mind the FHA back in the bad old days uh, uh, redlined and uh, had a lot of the discriminatory practices we heard about in the first panel. At the same time, when it comes to wealth creation, we have to remember what a nightmare public housing was for minority people. We don't want to think of it that way. If you look at the pruitt Igo uh, project in St. Louis, the neighborhoods that were wiped out there my own census research found that 21% of the homes were owned by minorities. They were torn down to make public housing in which nobody could own anything. We have to be careful to bring in the government to fix the problems because the government doesn't have a great track record of its own. I want to talk about what would constitute keeping a neighborhood good. Because historically, keeping a neighborhood good in the United States has meant making it more white than it is minority. Absolutely not. You, you say absolutely not, but I mean, there's a lot of evidence that shows. Oh, that was historically true. There's no doubt about it. But uh, that, the, the way t I think we have to make sure, and to me, the core of the Fair Housing Act is anybody who can afford to buy or rent must be allowed, based on their income, to do that. That, to me, is the well, core of the Fair th Housing Act. This, in part, gets back to the question of what is the core of the Fair Housing Act. Right, Some does. people would say that the core of the Fair Housing Act is simply to prevent discrimination. Others believe that core to the Fair Housing Act is implicit that we focus also on integration. I, I think there's a dual yes. mandate for the act that is often ignored, and that it's, there is a focus on the anti-discrimination principles, which is more at the individual level, kind of preventing discrimination in individual transactions. But 
the integration mandate of the Fair Housing Act is one that has often got left behind or ignored um, or rendered invisible through some of the work that's been done. And it's a very crucial mandate um, that requires kind of a different kind of structural, a look at the structural things that are preventing communities from true um, integration. And the one thing I want to add uh, is we have to all have to remember the Fair Housing Act obviously addressed was seeking to address and remedy deep racial segregation in housing, but it also was an important tool for addressing um, uh, the barriers for people with disabilities, for women, for people who were uh, didn't fit the, the traditional familial status, people of like um, gay and lesbian families and the like. And so, um, it's a, when I was at DOJ, the highest volume of cases that we were seeing were from the disability, uh, barriers on disability. So I just want to add that, that the integration mandate is one that is actually, it's a broad yeah. mandate. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. This, how much time we have? <laughs> so, um, you know, I would just say, look, uh, we, if, you, if you look at the Department of Labor saving statistic research, the level of inherited wealth in white non-Hispanic families is higher because of generational advantage. And this is an economic discussion. I'm not, not trying to make the social policy discussion, but we've disenfranchised minority communities for decades in this country, and I think it's going to take affirmative efforts uh, to try to create opportunity. I think that raises the economy. And to your point, you know, there's no separate but equal. We've proved that in education. We've proved that in other areas where there's good research. You have to you have to create opportunities to... Uh, did I say separate but equal? No, you didn't. I, I'm, I worry about um, uh, what efforts we have going forward in terms of making sure there's available affordable housing stock, that we look at underwriting uh, the way we underwrite families in America today and recognize that there are differences in diverse communities versus traditional uh, uh, underwriting standards of how families were approved. And you talked about the banks doing more. You know, almost every bank today doesn't hold their loans anymore. They, most of them don't have balance sheet and the regulators don't like them to hold their mortgages. So they sell them to Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae or get them insured by FHA and sell them in mortgage securities around the country. And those rules are established by the regulators involved. Mm -hmm. And you know, you make a very good point. You don't want to go so far as you create another uh, wrath of failure, which we saw in communities like Detroit and others that were so concentrated with the housing collapse in terms of adverse outcome to minority communities. But at the same time, I think we collectively can't use that as an excuse to not say, hey, we've got a real problem here. We need to look at the demographics that are shaping America today. This millennial generation is not white. It's two thirds are, are minority, and our economy depends on thinking differently about how we move forward. And I think that has to do with how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac underwrites uh, credit. I think it's how we focus our efforts on uh, monies being used in communities to build the right kind of housing stock. Um, I mean, all of these have to have come down to local policies, but to your point, I think it does start at the federal level, uh, and it's gonna take a concentrated effort to, to help identify the areas, which is why I keep going back to the fact that I think this is a crisis, and I think we need to focus on, have, a, have, have this created, established that way by the president uh, to focus on this area. I've called for this for years, that we need someone who focuses solely on this issue at the federal level reporting to a president who has teeth. And uh, I just don't think we have that effort in a way today, and it's getting worse. I mean, housing is getting more expensive and the gap's getting wider. So it's an area we need to focus on. I, I, I want to respond to that, but also go back to the point about the, the dual mandate of integration. I think that is the dual mandate, but we have to think deeply about what makes integration happen and be sustained. And so affirmatively furthering fair housing focused a lot on, uh, for instance, where it was implemented uh, to its greatest extent in Westchester County, New York, under a, a court order, mm -hmm. on let's build uh, affordable, which means subsidized rental housing for the most part, uh, in affluent areas. Sounds good. It's not a way for, for uh, renters to establish and build wealth because they don't own anything. I think we are better off focusing on zoning change at the local level. I think we all understand that one of the reasons we have a housing crisis, why is there such a housing crisis in a rich place like San Jose, California? Because 70% of the community is zoned for single family homes. Not everybody wants a single family home anymore. We have diverse buyers. We have, to, at the same time, mm -hmm. the hardest thing to convince uh, affluent suburban 
predominantly white, perhaps, uh, communities, is that they should accept subsidized housing, people who are much poorer than they are. That's the hardest thing. Right. Uh, I want to stop you for one second and let the audience know that we will be coming to you for questions in just a moment. So if you can start thinking about them now, condensing them all the way down, making sure that they are questions rather than comments, I would greatly appreciate it. And you can raise those hands high. There are mic runners in the audience. I, I just wanted to, to quote the dean of American sociologists, Herbert Gans of Columbia, who has written, experience with residential integration in many communities indicates that it can be achieved without problems. Herb Gans is not a conservative, by the way. It can be achieved without problems when the two races are similar in socioeconomic level. I think that is really important to keep. How do we sustain integration and minimize any tension? Do, do I wish that we didn't have to reassure white people? I do wish that, but that is a reality. That's, that's what we've had over the many years. And I think what we need to do is to open up zoning, convince these communities, you need more two-family homes. You need more three-family homes so that people of more modest means can live in your community. That's different than saying, let's build a 12-story a, a uh, public housing project. They're not going to go for that. We just saw in California, liberal California, a housing bill to, a, to uh, override local zoning to build uh, uh, mid-rise construction near transit-oriented development voted down by the, the, the uh, General Assembly I think I want to let Vanita and Dave respond very, very quickly, and then we're going to go to the audience. I would just say I, 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 it shouldn't be an either-or proposition. I think that with you know, th there are multiple taxes that need to be deployed, and there is a role uh, absolutely on the local side on these local zoning ordinances where local governments actually do have a particular role to play in uh, in furthering fair housing. So t to me, it doesn't remove the, the responsibility of the federal government to really seek to enforce the Federal Fair Housing Act in the way that it's meant to, and some of that requires having those kinds of goals um, to do so. Quick response. I, look, I, I, you know, I, after, in 2009, Secretary Donovan took a group of us down to New Orleans because it was the uh, response to the hurricane. And I visited parish after parish, and I saw the hardest hit parishes, the ones that had nothing left on their land, um, and those were heavily concentrated with minorities. And uh, I just think money needs to have a more aggressive way of flowing to communities. And I, you know, in the end of the day, you're talking about the Westchester County case as an example. Um, you know, if you can go to Larchmont High School, you're going to end up with a better education. And so. I mean, all of this sort of trickles downstream. It's a big problem, and you can't solve it in 25 minutes on stage. But I, I do think it's an area that we need to have an alignment around this needs focus. It needs to be prioritized by the president, and people need to start calling for it, not just at a 50th anniversary event. We need to start talking about it publicly, that this is too important for the US economy, because in the end of the day, uh, as we look forward and we look at the diversity of, of, of the generations that are going to be running this country, you have to create opportunity or our economy is not going to be what we want it to be. And so it's an economic discussion more than as much as it is a, uh, a sociological one. 10 I, seconds. But we're actually going to go to the The education can't be audience. reserved for a fortunate few. Okay. That's right. Well, that's right. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Antoine Thompson, uh, Executive Director of National Association of Real Estate Brokers, oldest black real estate association in the country. I just wanted to uh, say a couple quick things. One is a, a two question. First is for the a panel. Uh, if you all could uh, shed some light on America's historic role in providing access to uh, land for white Americans for hundreds of years through the Homestead Act, through land dispositions agreements for developers and, and uh, LDAs and things like that, and the risk that we often allow for whites to be successful and unsuccessful and we're a little more critical when African Americans are not. The other thing I would say is that out of the Great Depression, which David, I think, was getting at, is uh, a lot of programs came uh, into existence to help create uh, suburban, suburban America, as we know from books like Crabgrass Frontier and others, that this was orchestrated, uh, the homeowners to suburbia was created by, by the federal government. And when we look 50, 70 years later, you know, now we have this massive home ownership gap. What Sir, do you all say about that? 
Okay. And how do we fix it? Because we're I trying to we create want, too many new black homeowners. We want to make sure that we get other questions in. Yeah. So could just one person answer the historical question? So, I mean, look, FHA was created in 1934 to offer Title I loans to uh, rural communities and to farmers and uh, ranchers. Um, so I think that's right. I mean, to your point, Antoine, I, I think, uh, and, you know, great role NAREB can play as we move forward in this dialogue, but the, the reality is that we do have decades of disparities, and it's not a matter of fault, it's just a matter of reality, and we need to be thinking about public policies that help uh, create opportunity for those that have been neglected in the past, and if that's the point. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> oh no, I was, yeah. yeah. She wants We're to get another question. Right I, I will keep myself muzzled. <laughs> Hi, John Lewis with uh, Fannie Mae. My question is, do you think technology and innovation has an opportunity to be an equalizer in this field? So, I, um, I, so let me, you know, maybe focusing on the wrong thing, but I, we, we should talk about this because I think right now there are, we have to also address that the, the um, venues for accessing housing and ads and where ads are placed is all playing itself out online in a really big way that I think Facebook, now I can't remember what the percentage of housing ads are that are actually like being placed at mm -hmm. Facebook right now in terms of really owning the market around some of these issues. and. There's been a very long, uh, you know, a pretty rich uh, concern about Facebook's own ways that they are engaging in racial discrimination, discrimination to prevent certain people from being able, giving giving hosts actually the ability to click on who's going to receive which ads and the like, and being able to prevent that. So that's the negative side of the kind of changing the changing nature of where housing and housing access is playing itself out. Um, and so I think that that's a huge area that we have to focus on. The leadership conference has been long engaged with a process with Airbnb and now with Facebook to really address this problem because unless we're pretty intentional about it, there's a whole economy taking place that has so far been relatively untouched by, by the Fair Housing Act and that will be, become a huge loophole that will have huge consequences on our economy. Yeah, I, I'd like to see, in New York, we did a paper that showed that there's a good deal of what we call naturally occurring affordable housing housing in the private market that was as affordable as subsidized housing or low-income housing, but people don't know about it. And so I think that city governments can work with Street Easy and Zillow and organizations like this to say, you may not know that there's a house or an apartment you can afford, but there is. And I think that technology could be a reach-out mechanism in that kind of way. I know we could talk about this all day, but please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>